Hi guys, my name is Ashley and I'm a mom of two little girls. I have a two and a half year old toddler named Kylie and I also have an 11 month old baby named Mia. Now both of my girls have been sleeping in floor beds since they were babies, so I am a very big proponent of using a floor bed at home with your child, especially if you are trying to implement Montessori philosophies. If you are interested in learning a little bit more about floor beds, why you would want to use one and how to set one up in your child's room, then I will leave a link to a video that I have done already that is exclusively about floor beds. I will put a link in the description box below for you to check out when you're done watching this one. However, if you are watching this video, it's pretty likely that you are considering using a floor bed or maybe you are convinced that you do want to use a floor bed, but you still have some questions that you feel have been unanswered. So from one busy parent to another, based on my experiences today, I'm going to be sharing with you all of the answers to your Montessori floor bed questions. So the first topic that we're going to address is safety because that's typically a parent's number one point of concern when they're thinking about using a floor bed with their child. Now there are certainly some Montessori families that start out their newborns in a floor bed. And if that is something that you are comfortable with and you have baby proof the room to the best of your ability, then I say go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. However, when they are very little, sometimes, especially if you're breastfeeding, it's a little bit easier to have your baby in your room with you and have them closer. It also tends to give new parents a little bit more peace of mind to have their baby close by. So I would suggest, and this is what our family personally did, is keeping your baby in some sort of a bassinet in your room for the first three to four months of life. And once they reach that age, it's actually recommended that you move baby out of a bassinet anyway, because three to four months is typically when babies first begin learning how to crawl over. They also have some interesting little things going on in their brain development during that time, which causes them to be much more alert all of a sudden and their sleep patterns start changing and they aren't quite as sleepy as they were in the newborn stage. So that is kind of how I've come to this age as being a good time to transition if you do want to start your child out in a bassinet. Now once you do move baby over into the floor bed, there are a couple of things you want to look for when you are actually setting up the physical floor bed itself. The first one is that you want to find a low profile mattress. The lower or skinnier of a mattress that you can find, the better off you're going to be because of a few things that we're about to discuss in a little bit. Just as a point of reference, the mattresses that both of my girls use are about six inches thick, and I honestly probably would have gotten a smaller one if I could have found one, but that was generally the smallest size that I could find that contained coils on the inside, which is my next point. You want to make sure that the mattress you purchase is not one of those pillow top, gel memory foam, super plush and comfy type of mattresses that you would buy for an adult. You want it to be as firm as possible. So typically the old school inner spring mattress is the way to go. As far as the bedding is concerned, if your child is under the age of 12 months, you want to make sure that you're following all of the typical sleep guidelines for babies and that you are outfitting the mattress with only a fitted sheet. There should be no pillows or blankets or stuffed animals or other pillows, anything fluffy that could pose a suffocation hazard in your child's sleeping area. If you are concerned about your child staying warm, perhaps you live in a colder area or it's just winter time, you can always use a sleep sack, which is something that zips up over the child and keeps their feet and their lower half warm and just put them in a nice cozy pair of PJs underneath that. That should do them just fine. Now the mattress itself is either going to be sitting directly on the floor. And if you do that, then you need to make sure that you prop it out to let it air out and vacuum under it and things like that pretty regularly. I would say once every one to two weeks, just to avoid the potential for mold growth, especially if you live in a really humid climate, but you can also purchase a small frame that goes around the bed. The frame that we're using with my toddler Kylie is the Ikea Cora bed and the one that we're using with our daughter Mia is a Sprout Montessori floor bed frame. I will be sure to leave links down below if you guys are interested in checking either of those out. In either scenario though, your baby is not very far off the floor at all, at maximum a couple of inches. And if their room happens to be carpeted, then if they roll out, which is inevitable, it does happen at some point, they're not going to injure themselves. However, if you are concerned and you really don't like the idea of your baby rolling out, there are are a couple of different things that you can try. I personally tried using a pool fun noodle underneath the fitted sheet with Mia and that seemed to work pretty well until she became very proficient at rolling and then she would just roll right over it because they are pretty small in diameter. I have seen a couple of other products like these foam bumpers that are larger that are cut in half almost like a little half moon shape and those can be placed under the fitted sheet as well and they are a little bit rubbery so they should stay in place. You could try something like that and for any babies that are over the age of 12 months you can actually purchase something called a floor bed bumper. 
They're just basically big round pillows that go on the edges of the beds. I've seen a ton of them that are really cute, available for purchase on Etsy, and I will leave some links to those down below as well. Or you can go for a simple standard toddler bed rail, which I've seen all over different places to buy, including Amazon. And of course you want to make sure that every other aspect of your baby's room is completely baby proof because once they do become mobile, they will be able to leave their beds at their own will. And if you're needing any tips on what you need to do to baby proof your child's room, I actually just put out a video last week on baby proofing for yes spaces, and I will leave a link to that down below for you guys. So the next topic we're going to look at is what happens if my child gets out of bed? That's one of the number one concerns parents have after safety. Now, if your child is getting out of bed after you put them to sleep for playing in their room, if they do have a couple of books or small toys that are available to them. I can tell you right now, it's pretty likely that that is going to happen. It's because it's new, it's novel. Your child is like, whoa, I have freedom. I can get out and move around my room. This is cool. And once the novelty wears off, children will typically stay in their beds. But until that point, your child is probably going to get out of bed. It's just something that you have to make peace with. Once your child is done playing, they will either learn to take themselves back to their bed because they are truly sleepy and go to sleep, or sometimes they fall asleep right on the floor where they were playing. And as long as your child seems comfortable and they're getting a decent amount of sleep, I would say there's no problem with that. However, if your baby is trying to actively leave the room after you have put them down, the first thing you want to do to mitigate this is make Make sure that you close your child's bedroom door. You're going to do this for both naps and at nighttime, and this works especially well into early toddlerhood before they're actually able to open the door by themselves. You can also put up a simple pressure mounted baby gate in the doorway just as an extra means of safety, especially if you have other children who might enter the room when you are not supervising, or if your child somehow happens to learn how to open the door during one of their naps or one night while you're sleeping, you wouldn't want them leaving the room and potentially getting injured. So having a gate there is just a little bit of extra peace of mind and it's something that's really simple to do. Now let's say you've put your child down to sleep in their room and the door is shut, they're in their room, but they don't want to stay in there at the time that you have decided to put them down for sleep. They're not ready for sleep yet. They don't want to play. They start crying. What do you do then? Now, of course, if you decide to go in and comfort your child, that is an entirely personal decision that is up to you and based on what you're most comfortable with doing. So I would never deign to tell you what you should do. But what I will do is share with you my experiences having gone through this with two babies now, and they were two very different experiences. And after you've heard what my experiences were, then I will share with you what my general recommendations would be if you are going into this brand new. Now, because I nursed my toddler Kylie to sleep when she was a baby every single time, and after we weaned, I would stay in the room with her until she fell asleep every single time. She was not accustomed to falling asleep by herself. At 19 months old, I decided to use the gradual retreat method to help her learn how to fall asleep independently without me in the picture at all. And I did go into a lot of detail on a exactly what this process looks like in another video, which I will link down below. It's my Montessori at home independent sleep video. On the other hand, with my baby Mia, we have been using something that is referred to as the pause in bringing up BB. It's a book about French parenting and how it's very different from American parenting. I would highly recommend reading it, but we have been doing the pause that the author refers to since Mia was about three months old. And I didn't even realize that that's what it was, but that is what we have been doing. And I will talk in just a minute about what that looks like. Because we have been doing the pause since she was three months old, Mia falls asleep on her own all by herself without a fuss almost always. So when I put Mia down to sleep in her room, she either stays in her bed or she gets out to explore and then falls asleep, but no crying is involved at all. Now, when Mia will actually stay in her bed on her own every single time, or if she leaves her bed, when she will learn to bring herself back to her bed to go to sleep, that is still yet to be determined because we are definitely still in the middle of this stage where she falls asleep by the door all the time or in the middle of her room. And then sometimes she stays in her bed. It's really hit or miss but I am confident that eventually she will learn to stay in her bed. I just don't know when that's going to happen. When she gets a little bit older, if she does attempt to leave her room at all after I've put her down, then my response to Mia will probably be exactly the same as it was with Kylie. 
gentle but firm redirection back to her bed every single time, even if I have to do it 10 or 20 times in a row. If she is really persistent about it and continues to do it even after several days, then I may need to actually park myself outside of her door to be ready to redirect her back to her room. I did that with Kylie and it only took a couple of days before she caught on. The next topic that I'm only going to briefly address is co-sleeping. And I am not against co-sleeping in any fashion. My opinion is that if that is what your family feels is right for them and that's what's working for you, then that is your prerogative. So I am passing absolutely no judgment on what type of sleeping situation you have. I did not co-sleep with my children beyond falling asleep in bed with them while we were nursing on occasion and then eventually getting up and going back to my room. So I don't really have any experience with co-sleeping to share with you. So I really don't feel comfortable speaking to how to do this whole floor bed thing in a co-sleeping situation. So if you are co-sleeping and you were looking for answers, I'm so sorry that I cannot provide more insight to you. But my goal is always to be honest with you and in this situation, that's what it is. So based on those experiences, that I just shared with you with my girls and sleeping in floor beds from before the age of 12 months. I would like to share with you at this point what I would consider my recommendations for you, especially if you are starting out with a floor bed from day one, but these recommendations can also work if you are transitioning your child from a crib to a floor bed. I would say in either situation, I would follow the same sequence of steps here. The key is just being consistent. If you are wishy-washy and you go back and forth on what you're doing with your child, it sends very mixed messages and it's not very easy for them to learn what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So my first recommendation is put them into a floor bed as early of an age as you are comfortable with. The earlier you can get them in the floor bed and that becomes their only memory of the only place that they've ever slept, the easier it's going to be on you. And then you don't have to worry about the transition from a crib to a bed, which for some children can be a little bit frightening. You also want to create and use a very strict ritual for your nap times and bedtimes something that your child can recognize the markers for as you begin going through the routine every single time because this helps them to mentally and physically prepare for sleep. It sets them up for success. It could be as simple as changing their diaper, turning on a white noise machine and laying them down and leaving the room. But really nap and bedtime routines are up to you as the parent. So you can make them a little bit more elaborate if you want to, or you can make them really simple. Whatever you choose though, again, be consistent. Once you do put your child down for sleep, you need to leave the room very matter of factly. You're not rushing out of the room. You're not lingering and saying, oh, goodbye, honey, night, night. I love you. And making it take a lot longer than it needs to. You just put them down, give them a kiss, say whatever it is that you normally say to them right before you leave the room, leave the room, shut the door. End of story. When it comes to this step, you need to be all business. At this point, if your child stays in their bed and falls asleep, then success, yay, congratulations. It really is that easy. But for most kids, they're gonna need a little bit more help with learning, so here's what you do next. If they get out of their bed and they end up falling asleep on the floor, but they seem comfortable, don't worry about it. You can allow them to sleep there all night if necessary, as long as it looks like they're comfortable. And I would argue that if they're not waking up, then they probably are pretty comfy. I know as adults, we kind of cringe at the idea of sleeping on your floor, but just as a point of reference, my toddler for the last five days now has chosen to sleep on the floor next to her bed. I'm not sure why, but she insists on sleeping on her floor and also insists to me that it is very comfortable. So kids are strange. But all of this to say that there's no real reason to go in and move them back to their bed. If you do that, you're going to risk waking them up and then you have to worry about getting them back to sleep yet again. Now, if your child does begin to fuss or cry once you have left the room, here's how I would handle that. First, you're going to do the pause for about five to 10 minutes. And what the pause is, is you're not rushing into the room right away just because they've made a little noise or they're kind of fussing a little bit. You're giving them about five to 10 minutes to come to terms with the fact that it's time for sleep and they might not be ready to sleep right then and there and they can get up and play if they'd like. If they're not mobile yet, then obviously they can't get out of their bed. But the point is you need to give them some time to kind of sit there and process what's going on and learn that this is what the environment for sleep feels like and give them a chance to learn how to put themselves to sleep without you there. It's only five to 10 minutes. You're not leaving them to cry it out for exorbitant amounts of time, but give them that little bit of time to try to figure it out on their own and learn to fall asleep. If you rush in right away, they're never going to have the opportunity. And what you might be surprised by is a lot of the time a baby will fuss for a few minutes 
and then they'll just fall asleep. However, if the crying continues, I would say that it's reasonable to assume that they need something from you. And at that point, I would urge you, yes, go in, reassure your child, check their diaper, pat them, whatever you need to do. For a lot of parents, this makes you feel a little bit better, but in my experience, this made my child even more upset. So this was something that I personally skipped, but you can certainly do it if you think it is helping your child to calm down a little bit. But here's the key. After you've done that, you leave the room again and you do the pause again and give them a chance to see if they can fall asleep this time. If your child continues to fuss beyond that point, I would argue that maybe your child really isn't all that sleepy. Maybe you've tried to put them down a little bit too early. So what I would do, and this is what I did with Mia, I would go in and open the curtains, turn off the noise machine, I would get her up as if she had napped, and keep her up for like another 45 minutes to an hour, and then I would try the process all over again. Usually by that point, they are a lot sleepier, and it's a lot more likely that you're going to have success with them learning to fall asleep by themselves. This is especially true when they are very young, and I will leave a link to something called the baby nap chart, which has been an immensely valuable tool for me as a parent in figuring out roughly how long my baby should be able to stay awake before getting sleepy. And what I would suggest is take a look at this baby nap chart for how old your child is and look at the range they give you. If they say that your baby is capable of staying awake for one to two hours, then I would try to keep your baby up and awake for that maximum amount of time as best as you can. Sometimes it's very clear that they are sleepy much earlier than that. Maybe after an hour or an hour and a half, they start getting sleepy. But generally, if your baby is still awake and you can keep them up to that maximum time, you are going to find that when you put them down, they really are actually sleepy. And it's a lot more likely that they're going to go to sleep. So the process I've described is what you would do for naps. At nighttime, it is basically the same thing with the exception of one caveat. For babies between the ages of zero and six months, you always want to feed your baby at night according to your pediatrician's guidelines and based on your child's age and their overall health, you always want to respond to all cries and go in and feed them because generally in that stage, especially when they're newborns and for some babies, again, up through about six months, they genuinely are hungry at night. So you can't just leave them to be. Now you can nurse them back to sleep during the nighttime or give them a bottle and put them back in bed. There's nothing wrong with that. And generally I found that it doesn't really mess with their ability to learn to fall asleep independently because it is nighttime and they are very sleepy as it is. But as soon as you are done offering them milk, then you want to leave again. Once baby is ready to be weaned at nighttime, at that point you want to put your baby down to bed at night with a predictable routine, shut the door, and you only want to go in after you've done the pause for about five to 10 minutes each time they wake up during the nighttime. You really want to give them that opportunity to see if they can fall back to sleep by themselves. And because of that circadian rhythm, there's a lot greater of a likelihood that they are going to fall back asleep. If the crying persists beyond that point, then of course, if you feel that you need to, you can go in to check their diaper, pat them, reassure them. But I would not suggest offering any milk, especially if you are trying to nighttime wean them or if they have already been weaned at night. So those are all of my answers to your floor bed questions. Hopefully I got to all of them. If there are any others that I left out, feel free to leave them in the comments down below and I will do my best to respond. If you liked today's video, then please be sure to give it a big thumbs up. And just in case you are new to my channel, I did want to let you know that this video is part of a larger series called Montessori at Home, which is aimed at providing practical tips and advice for busy parents like you and I for implementing Montessori philosophies at home with your children. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in learning more about, then you might consider subscribing to my channel this way you don't miss a new video because I do upload a new one just like this one every single week. Thanks so much for watching today and I'll see you next time. Bye.